Well, good morning. Welcome to Redemption Church. If you're in the lobby, get in here. It's time. It's 1030. It's time to get after the Lord. Uh, welcome to Redemption Church. If you're visiting us, my name is Josh Perry. I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, if you are one of our guests, we, we want to be hospitable to you. We, we think of ourselves as a church family, and uh, we, we want our, our worship gatherings to be hospitable as if we are having guests in our home uh, so that you feel welcomed, that you feel wanted, that you feel served. Uh, we, we want to make the message of Christ, the message of the Scriptures, to be as accessible and clear and and winsome and, and, and compelling as we possibly can. Uh, you can't tell it yet. It, oh, this, this whole room will fill up here about 15 minutes after the singing's over. People will start rolling in and, and, uh, and pack this place out. But uh, we've got a lot of new folks uh, this fall visiting and, and uh, getting to know us, us getting to know them. And if that is you, we would love for you to... Uh, to call this place your spiritual home, not just a place that you visit and uh, that you're, you're feeling like a guest. Take as much time as you need to, to ask those questions of what Christianity is, what the ch this church believes, what are our values, our convictions, our distinctions. Uh, we want to make that uh, very well known and, and give you the, the space to make that that pursuit, but uh, it is also uh, God's calling on His people that you would be a part of a church. You read the New Testament, and it is a very explicit as well as implicit understanding that that you're a part of a local church. And so uh, we have actually a membership class that will start October 9th, 9 a.m. here at the the church uh, for six consecutive weeks on Sundays, again starting October 9th, in which we will lay out what the church believes, why we believe it, uh, the practical outworkings of those beliefs and do how we are structured, how we do leadership, how we engage in mission, how we serve one another, what our expectations are of our members, what members' expectations are of the church. Uh, and, and so I really encourage you to sign up for that at our Connect desk or fill out a Connect card and check that you would like to be signed up for that, and we'll make sure that we, we get you in that class. It's free. Uh, child care will be provided. Just let us know that you need that. You're not required to be a member of this church going through it, but it is a requisite for membership. And again, that's not just a hoop to jump through. It is to help you make a robust informed decision on whether or not this will not just be a church that you attend, but a church that is your home, is your family. So we want, we want you to be a part of our family. Go ahead and stand up as folks are filing in. Got our kiddos back there, going to sing loud. And uh, as our call to worship, Ephesians 2, verses 18 through 22 really uh, undergird some of what I've already said already. For through Him, that is the person of Christ, we have access in one spirit to the Father. See, there's that family language that we come into the family of God through faith in Christ. We receive the Spirit of God and we get the right to call God our Father. So then, we're no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. That's the teaching of those men, which has now been codified and put together in what we have as our Bible, our Old and New Testament. And Christ Jesus Himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So that's why we've gathered, to be formed by those Scriptures, to be centered on the person and the work and the message of Jesus Christ, and we do it together, being formed into the family of God. So welcome. Let's worship God together. i 
His work is finished. He has spoken this hope to me. Though the sun has ceased its shining, though the war appeared as lost, Christ has triumphed over evil. It was finished upon the cross.
Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once you're in our need, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. For there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Let's sing to the holy God. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else could whisper and darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor outshines the sun? And what other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the glory consumes like fire what other power can raise the Ask 
could rescue me from my failing Who else would offer his only son And who else invites me to call him father As we enter our time of corporate prayer this morning, I would ask that you bow your head in reverence, that you close your eyes to ease distraction, and that you make your heart, your soul, your body, your mind still before the Lord. Father, we come to you this morning in great need, knowing that you are the only one who can meet any of our needs. You are the only help, our only hope, our only means of being saved, our one and only God. Thank you for your sovereignty over all our situations and circumstances, that you are able to take everything and anything that is bad in our lives, that is wicked in our lives, that is evil, that is sinful, all things, your word tells us, and work them together for our ultimate good and your ultimate glory. Father, with this promise, we can face any circumstance, any situation. Even our constant battle with sin, you do this. And it is such a weary and ongoing war that we fight. As the Apostle Paul said in his struggle, the good that we want to do, we do not do. But the very thing that we often do not want to do, that seems to be what we do with ease. What a wretched man I am, he said, who will save me from this body of death. And then he answers that question with great clarity. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is the answer, because you are the only answer for our sin. So we confess our sins to you this morning in a moment of silent reflection. Lord, you answer that confession with great 
hope that if we confess our sins and turn from them, you are faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for your great cleansing this morning through the blood of Jesus and his perfect sacrifice for those sins. And so now we pray that you would cause us as Christians, as your church, to walk in holiness according to your word in Romans chapter 12, that you would let our love be genuine, that we would show disgust for evil, that we would hold fast to what is good, that we would love one another with brotherly love, that we would work to outdo one another in showing honor, that we would not be lazy, but that we would serve the Lord, that we would rejoice in hope and be patient in tribulation and be constant in prayer, that we would contribute to the needs of others and show hospitality and bless those who persecute us, that we would rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, and that we would live in harmony with one another, not being haughty but associate with the lowly, that we would never be wise in our own sight, that we would not repay evil for evil, but evil with good, that we would do what is honorable, and as far as it depends on us, that we would live in peace with everyone, that we would never avenge ourselves, but leave vengeance to God And that if our enemy is hungry, we would feed him. If he is thirsty, we would give him something to drink. And that we in this evil generation would not be overcome by that evil, but instead would overcome evil with good. Father, we will only do these things if you permit, if you give us the strength and the mind and the heart. So change us now. Make us more like Jesus, that we would be seen and known in this community as little Christs, as Christians. We ask this in your name and for your fame. And Redemption Church said, amen. There's always a lot of nostalgia and deep emotion surrounding coming home, particularly if we've been gone for a long time or while we've been away from home, we've gone through some particularly harsh or difficult situations. One of the more iconic images in our nation's history is all of those soldiers coming back from Europe or Japan in the days of World War II and those battleships just teeming with soldiers waving and cheering and, and with excitement sailing into the, to the United States harbors. And then on the shorelines, all the family crying and celebrating and then it spills into the streets where pandemonium breaks out and we've all seen that iconic sailor dipping that woman in his arms laying a big old deep passionate kiss on her I've come to find out later if the the legend's true that that they didn't even know each other they just sort of lost themselves in all the excitement of 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 our boys being back and it doesn't seem like a week goes by that a video doesn't make its way into our social media feed where a Father who's been in the military for a period of time dresses up at a little league game or a birthday party or, or a school and reveals to his child that he's, that he's back home and they embrace and hug and kiss and usually enjoy sob on one another's shoulder. And even though we don't have any idea who those people are, we find ourselves getting a little misty because we know exactly what that feels like to come home. Some of you are away from home now. This is where your home is, but you count down the days to Thanksgiving and Christmas or 
summer vacations where you get to go back to the familiar sounds and smells and sights and most importantly the people that mean the most to you who live live at home uh, I don't get too emotional in my life but I confess that the most emotional part of my day while not as dramatic as coming home from war uh, is in the evening after having worked or gone about whatever the events and tasks of my day were is driving up my street and seeing my house come into view, my favorite place in the world, because my favorite people on earth are there, which is really why home and the idea of it has such emotion and nostalgia. If you're not feeling it by now, maybe a, a poem will help. Preachers always have to lean on poems as a crutch to sort of get people feeling things. It's, it's written by a father about his house and how that is connected to his family. It's entitled, The Laughter in the Walls. I pass a lot of houses on my way home, some pretty, some expensive, some inviting, but my heart always skips a beat when I turn down the road and see my house nestled against its hill. I guess I'm especially proud of the house and the way it looks because I drew the plans myself. It started out large enough for all of us. I, I even had a study. Two, teen two teenaged boys now reside there. And it had a guest room. My girls and nine dolls are, are permanent guests. It had a small room for my wife, Peg. She had hoped she would have a sewing room. Well, the two boys swinging on the Dutch door have claimed that room for their own. So it really doesn't look right now as if I'm much of an architect. But it'll get larger again. One by one, they'll go away. I've read this thing 20 times <laughs> before I got in here. To work, to college, to service, to their own houses. Then there'll be room. Then there'll be a guest room, a study, a sewing room for just the two of us. But it won't be empty. Every corner, every room, every nick in the coffee table will be crowded with memories, memories of picnics, parties, Christmases, bedside vigils, summers, fires, winters, going barefoot, leaving for vacation, cats, conversations, black eyes, graduations, first dates, ball games, arguments, washing dishes, bicycles, dogs, boat rides, getting home from vacation, meals, rabbits, and a thousand other things that still fill the lives of those who would raise five. And my wife and I will sit quietly by the fire and listen to the laughter in the walls. That's what it is to come home. I don't think that's an accident. I think God built that feeling, that context, that, that institution of family to give us a taste and an understanding and a reflection of His eternal design to create a family for Himself. Not that he needed it, but to display his glory and to give us the joy of what it is to, to call God Father, to know his Son, Jesus Christ, and so that we could be brothers and sisters in, in Christ. And like that iconic Homeric poem, to, to like Odysseus, spend our lives making our way home. And our lives is, is really all of the things that we encounter on the way and what he's making us to, to be. I go there because in our study through the book of Acts that we've enjoyed for over a year now, verse by verse, uh, which tells the story of those first century Christians and those first century lives and how the good news of Jesus' life and death and resurrection makes it possible for all men and women everywhere 
regardless of where they've lived, the times in which they've lived, or what they've done, or whatever race or, or socioeconomic class they find themselves, that they too can be brought in to the family of God and how that began to spread over the continent. And we're at a place in our study at the end of, of, of chapter 14 where we've got a couple of men who are beginning to, to long for home to. Uh, had nothing to do with a, a doubt that they were in God's plan. They were right in the nucleus of His will. They, they had no sense of wanting to get out of the mission that they were on. I mean, they were right on the, the front row of their, their dreams for the future, no longer being dreams of the future, but becoming their present reality. They, 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 they wouldn't change a thing about this two-year journey that they'd been on and the 1,500 miles of hard road and, and dangerous oceans that they'd traveled. They not only made new friends, but in places in which there were, were no Christians. Many times they'd never even heard the name of Jesus. There were now healthy churches, followers of Jesus Christ, Little outpost families in the places that they lived were beginning to be scattered all over the region. Him and Paul and Barnabas had become a band of brothers through the difficulty and the opposition, even the life-threatening situations that they had that they'd experienced. Paul will speak of this time as a time in which he began to bear on his body the marks of the Lord Jesus. But there were still no regrets, absolutely no regrets. But about this time, the emotional heartbeat that all of us have uh, began to to become more visceral as they, they thought of home. Different generation, different culture, different language, different era of time, but they would have teared up as well at the phrase, the laughter in the walls. And so they, they, they start to, to journey back in these eight verses, the end of Acts 14. And I want to make sure, and I, I start like this because I, I don't want these eight verses to just be printed words on a page. We're, we're, we're going to think through maps, but this isn't about dots on a map of 2,000 years ago in places that most of us have never been or perhaps will even ever go. This isn't about parsing participles, although we'll do some of that. All important in thinking God's thoughts after Him, but, but this is also about feeling God's heart with Him through these people. And if we do that, then, then these verses, our time this morning, will be as relevant as anything you experience all week, which is what I want. Now, before we get them home, it's going to be good to remind us of, of where they are and where they've been. As I mentioned, it was, it's, it's been a couple of years before Acts 14 that, that Paul and Barnabas, leaders, teachers, in a vibrant, healthy, familiar, loving church, were selected by God and with the support and affirmation of their church, sent out to go to places where, where Christ was not known. That was Jesus' mission. They'd been doing that. And now let's go as far out as it's ever been. In fact, farther than it's ever been with that message. And so they grabbed an assistant named John Mark and they shoved off into the Mediterranean and landed at uh, an island that was nicknamed the Happy Island and they swept east to west across that in a whirlwind tour of, of evangelism and making Christ known and the result was only one convert. Well, that's a start. And with that sort of prelude or prologue to the trip, they left Cyprus and headed northwest up into the continent of Eurasia 
in Pamphylia, a coastline that was notorious for malaria and fever. And Paul gets sicker than a dog. And he, he recovers, but from that point on will have chronic debilitating headaches that he will later call a thorn in the flesh. And just as he's sort of getting well enough to travel, they're looking at one of the most dangerous mountainous regions of that area, the Taurus Mountains. And John at that point says, only one convert, and I've been seasick, and, and this has not been fun, and it's only going to get harder. I'm not up for this. And so he deserts and goes back to his mother on the first ship that he can to Jerusalem. But Paul and Barnabas, they, they kept going. They go 100 miles inland, up about 3,500 feet feet elevation to a town they'd never been in, didn't know a soul, to an, another kind of, of Antioch. Not Antioch of Syria, which is where their church was and their home was, but Antioch of Pisidia. It was a strategic place culturally. It was cosmopolitan. Commercially, it was a crossroads town. People from all over the continents of both Asia and Europe were coming east and west and north and south. And so if they could get a foothold of the gospel in Antioch of Pisidia, it can move west into Europe or east into Asia and by God's grace begin to spread. And so they, being Jewish, met a Jewish community, preached the gospel for a number of weeks. Revival breaks out, not only among the community there, but the whole town is packed out to hear the gospel preached. And some believe, and some don't believe, and some cautiously said, we'll hear more. But you couldn't have missed the reverberations that are sort of echoing out in the city. And when that happens, especially in a Roman province, people can get a little antsy. Because if you know the Roman policy, you can get away with quite a bit just so long as you keep your head down and they don't have to hear about it. Don't create any drama. Well, the gospel is always bringing divisiveness and drama wherever it goes. And, and so the Jewish leaders, out of jealousy and envy and a little bit of fear, moved uh, Paul and Barnabas on to the next town. And so they go down to Iconium where the exact same thing happens divisiveness, except this time it even gets more tumultuous, but because of the, the Greek mythology of, the, of Iconium being so deeply rooted, they thought because of a miraculous healing that accompanied the preaching of the gospel in Iconium, that Zeus and Hermes had come, and oh, all kinds of uh, drama and heated emotion was breaking loose, and so they again faced persecution, but a gospel Seeds are planted, Christians are, are brought into the family, new churches are beginning to emerge, and Paul and Barnabas head down to, this time, a place called Lystra. And, and again, same results, it's just same song, second verse. Roller coaster ride of both people coming to Christ, churches being planted, persecution, move to the next town. Except in this town, it, persecution intensified to the point to where Paul was pegged by rocks, thought he was dead, even threw him to where you put dead bodies, but he wasn't dead. So the Christians that came to Christ in Lystra, along with Bar Barnabas, sort of get him together, and once he's recovered, I assume over a number of weeks, they then limp out of Lystra into Derby, And it's in Derby. In verse 21, where we pick up the story. So turn with me when we read, When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, so more Christians there in Derby, they returned. So they retraced their steps. They go back to Lystra and then to Iconium and then to Antioch. Now why did they do that? It wasn't because of, like John Mark, they're deserting. It's too hard I, I, let's go back home. It's not out of fear of more or intensification of persecution to come. So don't think it's lack of faith. I say that for two reasons. One reason is what is ahead of them geographically. 
tells me it, it wasn't out of fear or, or lack of faith. The second reason is what was behind them geographically, that it wasn't because of lack of, of faith or fear. What was ahead of them, and if you have a map of this journey in your Bible or you find it online, you'll see that ahead of them was Cilicia. They were right on the, the doorstep of that region. A major town there was Tarsus, where Paul was actually born and raised. And in Acts 9 and 11, if you remember, Cilicia had already been evangelized. Certainly there were more places and more people to hear the gospel, but there were Christians and churches established there. And it was Paul's desire that he go to places in which there were no Christians, there were no churches. He wanted to go where Christ had not been preached, where there was no foundation of the gospel. So when they get to Cilicia, they've kind of come to the place of, we've covered the area. So we don't need to keep going. Also, if you were afraid or you lacked faith, you wouldn't have gone back to the cities. This is what's behind them that they almost killed you in. But that's exactly what they do. Well, why did they do that? Verse 22, they wanted to strengthen the souls of the disciples. They were encouraging them to continue in the faith. And they were saying that uh, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom, the kingdom of God. So, so that's the reason. About three things here if you, you look at it uh, that were there. Strengthening their souls, encouraging them to continue in the faith. And then in verse 23 you're going to see that they appoint elders. So why do they do that? Well... Again, think of where they've been. Every one of the Christians in, in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and Derby had come to faith in a context of emotion and conflict and drama and speed and upheaval. Lives being changed. If you're a Christian for the very first time, remember they have no Bible. They can't get on a website and, and look up justification. They can't, they can't look up grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. There's no podcast to listen to on here's how church leadership should work. There's no book that they can read. There's no church constitution or doctrinal statement that they can ask like-minded churches to look at in order to sort of put themselves together. They have questions about their Christian lives. Since we've trusted Christ, what are the implications on sex and money and marriage and parenting and work? How are we to, to do mission in this, this town? How do we organize, are to organize ourselves? What should our public worship gatherings be, be like? They had no access to any content. They've been Christian days, weeks. This had happened in Acts 2, if you remember, but... They had 12 apostles who had spent three and a half years with Jesus. They had men who had been given the supernatural ability and, and authority and position to, to root the church theologically and to structure it pragmatically. Paul and Barnabas just moved to the next town. They didn't have anything. So what do we do? And, and, and Paul and Barnabas realized that. So let's go back, let's retrace our, our steps and, you know, help them get rooted. Maybe this is helpful. On their first part of the trip, it was all about evangelism. The return trip was all about discipleship. The, the first part of the trip was all about preaching Christ to a, to a people in the hopes that they would trust Christ. The return trip was preaching Christ so that people would be able to be built up into Christ's likeness. The target audience on the way out was, was non-Christians in the hope that they would trust Christ. The return trip, the target audience, was believers in the hopes that they would become conformed into the image of Christ. So let's tick these off. First one is strengthening the souls of, of the disciples. So, so that's their, their, uh, their goal. It's a, a rare verb, strengthening. It's used only here and 
two times in Acts chapter 15, and never again in the New Testament. Uh, it, it, it has the idea, according to A.T. Roberts, and I love his uh, word pictures of the New Testament and his commentary, it, it, it's a tense that carries with it the idea of turning something into more than a belief, more of a deeply held conviction, and has the notion of a creed. So on the first encounter with the gospel and some of the truths of the of Christ and and salvation and the church and the Christian life that they'd heard from Paul like all of us do you don't know where it's at in the bible you 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 don't know uh really how to articulate the beliefs well you don't know how to defend it uh you don't know all of the deep you know, beautiful fullness of whatever it is that, that God has done for us in Christ. You just hear it. It's compelling. It's not that it's blind faith, but you believe it. And then at some point, it kind of grows into, a, not only do I believe it, I'm, I'm really, I deeply feel it. I deeply own it. It's a conviction. And then as you mature and develop it, in your understanding of that truth and that felt enjoyment and experience of what the truth is in your relationship with God, you even could come to the place where, like a creed, it is a core identity of who you are. And you can say it with con not only conviction, but you with, with uh, articulation and with boldness. That's what Paul and Barnabas are doing in strengthening their souls. I, I take it that they spend time helping them craft. These are the core doctrines of Christianity. Closed hand, we're dying on the hill. You don't own this, you're not a Christian. You don't believe this, you're not a church. And they're built up in that. Teaching them vocabulary. There's words that go along with these these truths. So he sort sort of founds them on that. We are a church that gathers every Sunday to be formed as a church community. We also have things called gospel communities, small group ministries that meet in homes for the purpose primarily of fellowship, of community, of friendship. It's less formative and more corrective as the applied message of the, or the gospel that we heard on Sunday is applied in our lives. In addition to that, we have what I would now call, or practically just to tie it into the scriptures, what we might call strengthening ministries. I'm thinking of Bible studies, book studies, women's triad discipleships, men's discipleship, retreats all sort of geared toward taking what we believe and what the Scriptures teach and strengthening our souls so that we lay down roots, that we become deep and substantive in our beliefs and in our lifestyle. If you're engaged in that kind of ministry, stay at it. That is so valuable to our church. And that's what is going on here. The second thing they do, and I love the balance of, the, of the, the discipleship ministry of Paul and Barnabas. They not only strengthened them theologically and biblically, but they encouraged them to continue in the faith. One of the occupational hazards of strengthening ministries, one of the, the, the tendencies or perhaps threats, dangers of those kinds of ministries is they can become all intellectual. They can become sort of debating societies. Even can sometimes turn into pride. We're right, they're wrong. It's correcting theology. It's, it's, it's sort of minutia and specific theology. And it can even at times become discouraging to those who perhaps aren't really getting it yet. That's not true of this group. Good theology should be encouragement. Good teaching should be encouragement. The reason you want to know your Bible, you want to articulate great doctrinal truth, is it helps you sleep at night. It encourages you. It builds you up. Like the Peanuts cartoon. I remember 
Linus was always sort of the resident theologian. I don't know if you noticed that in the, the Charlie Brown little cartoon group. He's always the one who's quoting the scripture and pointing people. And I remember it was pouring the rain in one of those cartoons, and Lucy, she was all discouraged, and she said, I hope it doesn't rain and flood the entire world and kill us all. Something like that. Linus said, that'll never happen because God promised that he would never flood the earth again. That the rainbow sign in the, in the sky tells us that, that God is a God of mercy and kindness and he will never flood the earth again. And she said, Whew, that really takes a load off. And Linus said, good theology will do that. That's right. Good theology should encourage you. I, I tell you, I have to hear that. People sometimes come to me for questions. They come to me for counsel. And there's good in this. My first instinct is to... Well, here's a verse, or here's a truth about what is true of us in Christ that perhaps you've forgotten or you didn't know. And all of that is right. But you know what most people are coming to me for, for counsel? Encouragement. They're not looking for my answers. I have so, I have so few answers. When I first was pastoring, I had answers for every. I had answers to questions you aren't even asking. And now I've, I'm a lot less given answers and solving problems, and I'm more just encouraging you in the Scriptures. I think that's a good, balanced ministry that these guys are, are, are doing. Wouldn't it be great if Redemption Church would become well-known and our distinctive trait would be encouragement? We are very much like the Ephesians church if we have a danger, I don't, well, I won't go that far, but we're in danger of becoming the Ephesian church in the book of Revelation. We hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. We are a church known in our community and known uh, not only our church, uh, fellow churches as being a robust, theological, biblical, great teaching, doctrinal church. We're always going to be that. It's who we are. But we should also be known equally as much as being loving, being kind, encouraging. Ray Ortland, one of our fellow pastors in our church planting network one time said, I have never met a person who is suffering from over-encouragement. There are all kinds of people suffering discouragement. Uh, nobody's too encouraged. How fun would it be is if we, every day this week, or for the rest of our lives, left our house and said, I'm going to see how many people I can encourage today. It's a great spiritual quality. Now look at the third thing that they, they do. Verse 23, and when they had appointed... Oh, don't want to skip this. Some of you will get mad at me. In your, some of you in your strengthening ministries will get mad at me. I skipped the last part of verse 22. Look at why they need encouragement. It is because through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Because you'll never stop needing encouraged. Like Odysseus as well, where our journey home is, is hard. It is, is tribulation. It's difficult. It's full of suffering. So we need encouragement and we need strengthening. You're not make it home if you don't have relational encouragement. You don't have deep roots in your theology. Third thing they do is in verse 23, they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting. I've taught on this a number of times. I'll do it again in the membership class. But the biblical command and instruction and structure of a local church is that it would be led by elders. When I say elders, hear pastors, hear overseers, hear shepherds. All synonyms, all the same office, all the same position within a local church that God uh, designs for the church family to have in order to be loved, cared for, taught, and defended. The elder title is the concept of people who are spiritually mature in the community. The oversight title has the idea that they will sort of at, at a big picture level oversee the church that makes sure that the values and the theology and the structure is in place so that people are being well served. The pastor title, which is pastoral, and the shepherd title is, is one of, of a posture of the heart of a pastor. 
that we feed the sheep, that we care for the sheep, that we, that we, uh, that we defend the sheep, we protect the sheep. And every church, church has that. And the qualifications of godly qualified leadership are found in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, and you will discover that they're spiritual qualifications. It's not every church has CEOs. Every church has great charismatic personalities. Every church has gifted leaders even. No, every church has elders. Notice it's always in the plural. And every church gets one. One of the first goals that I had in starting Redemption Church was to appoint elders. Not only because it was biblical, but it was to protect you from me. And it was to protect me from you. It's beautiful that you have a built-in, accountable structure of leaders who love Jesus, who believe the Bible, who love the church, and not one of them can sort of turn it into their little kingdom or their little business, or their little personality. And so Paul wanted to right away make sure that they, they had that. Now, how did they appoint them? With prayer and fasting. So it took time. It took assessment. It, it took prayer to God for Him to reveal it. Now, there's a little intramural debate here in this word appoint. Some churches, like ours, believe that appointing means that the elders were select, not only select, weren't selected, but were installed by Paul and Barnabas. That, and that these elders forward would have that same authority to appoint more elders as the need arised. And that as churches sent out pastors, elders, to go start new works that they had the authority to appoint elders in those, those places. So it's a more Presbyterian style of, of government. So appoint literally means to stretch out one's hand. So Paul and Barnabas stretched out one's, their hands to, to make elders in that church. So what does that mean? Well, we believe, and this is an open hand, you, you can disagree and still be a Christian, you know, whatever, uh, that they, you, you, they're stretching out your hand. You. Others of a congregational polity or structure of government says to stretch out the hand is this. Who thinks that Josh Perry should be an elder? Raise your hand. And everybody, mm. they stretched out their hand that way. So it was voting or, or selecting that way. Regardless if you believe more what we believe or you want to be wrong and find out when we get home, uh, you know, and you vote, that, that, that's fine. But the point is, is that there's assessment there's qualifying that these are godly leaders. It's deeply important in a strong church. You show me a church that does not have godly qualified leadership, and I will show you a church that is, uh, is bad, unhealthy, or, or about to be. Uh, you show me a church that is, has godly qualified leaders, and boy, God bails them out of quite a bit. Uh, and so this, this uh, mission trip back, they get rooted there, there biblically. I love also that, uh, that all of this is, is done within the context of committing them to the Lord in whom they believed. You better believe you do that. Because as, as, as an elder, whew, you see how the sausage is made, right? And you know what kind of competency and weakness that we have as leaders, and, and you, you, uh, you know very quick that no church is perfect, no leader is perfect, no leadership group is perfect, no doctrinal uh, belief system is perfect. And so if a church is going to be healthy and a church is going to be effective in its mission, oh, God help us. We need to commit them, commit this church, commit ourselves to the Lord in whom we believe. It's God's power. It's God's grace. It's God's message. You're God's church. That's how I sleep at night, knowing that this church is safe, not because I'm good or our elders are good or you're good, but because God's good. He'll take care of us. He'll lead us. He'll provide for us. He'll make sure that the gates of hell do, cannot prevail against the mission of the church. And you know what? That goes for your kids too, parents. 
That's how I sleep as a parent. He loves your kids more than you love them. He cares about them more than you care about them. He knows more about them than you do. When you can't be around, He's around. The things that they need to know and feel and believe, He can do that in ways that you can't. And good news as a father, when I screw them up and when I make mistakes, He can fix them. I, 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 like all of us, one day every one of my kids is going to be on somebody's couch working through some issues in their life and they're going to say, well, my dad, he did this and he said that and he was like this. And as that surfaces, I can repent and I can say, I'm sorry, I didn't know or I thought I knew or I knew and I was wrong and all this stuff. You know what? God can fix them. You commit them to the Lord. That's true of your marriage. That's true of your work. That's true of your health. That's true of your your school is true of your, your ministry. And that allows Paul and Barnabas to leave and go home saying, we're leaving. But you know what? Jesus is your senior pastor. He's staying. We're gone. You won't have all of the teaching about every issue that you go through. But guess what? You too are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and He'll stay. And so they're, they're able to, to go. And with that, they hightail it back home. Look at how fast it goes. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there, they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had, that they had fulfilled. And I'm sure that, that as they sailed, uh, sailed through there, or sailed back into uh, uh, Seleucia, the port, near Antioch of Syria, and they made their way up to Antioch in that final bend, and they saw home that they said, ah, oh, there it is. Did you catch our word again? It says that when they left the churches there in Galatia, that they committed them to the Lord. Where did they get that from? Well, they got that from their church in Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. You know what they discovered when they got back home, church? This place is fine without us. This place has been doing better since we left. Guess what that means? We left all those churches in Antioch and Pisidia and Iconium and Lystra and Derbe and God knows where else. And They're going to be fine without us too. They encouraged them. And then they, having gotten in when they arrived, they gathered the church together. I love that it doesn't say they gathered at the church together. It says they gathered the church together. Why? Because people are the church. You are the church. You didn't come to church this morning. We gathered the church together. You are Redemption Church. This is the old Orpheum Theater where... On Sundays, the church gathers. And then the other days of the week, the church scatters to all of those places that, that, that you go. And so they gather the church together and they do two things. They declared all that God had done with them and how He had opened a door to, of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the, the disciples. So the first thing they do is say, listen to all this great stuff that was done and we're not taking credit for it. God did it. God opened the door. God brought people into the family of God. God started those churches. God strengthened their souls. God encouraged them in the faith. God raised up qualified godly, godly leadership. And second... It isn't a one-off what has been happening here in Antioch of Syria. God is calling Jews and Gentiles, men and women, slaves and free, people of all classes together into the family of God, which doesn't seem like a big deal to us because we live in a day in which most of us are Gentile and most of the Christian church is a Gentile. But in that day, it was a huge shift huge shift. In chapter 15, there's going to be a f the first big church council and the first church creed on uh, 
should non-Jewish Christians take on Jewish customs and Jewish rituals and Jewish culture in order to be the people of God or not? Big fight. Not a, well, yeah, a big fight is going to break out over this. It's going to be a discussion. It, what you see here is that the people of God were in the Old Testament a come and see kind of mentality. Now the Christian faith in Christ, it's now a go tell. It's not ethnocentric. It's, it's diverse. It's not ge geopolitical in a city like Jerusalem. It is now uh, every nation and every tongue and every, every tribe. All right, let me finish up here with two applications. And you don't have to turn there, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read one verse out of 1 Peter chapter 5 that kind of sums up what I think chapters 13 and 14 are, are all about, if I can find it here. 1 Peter 5, verse 10, I think. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That is what this trip has done. Paul and Barnabas suffered for a little while, and God did all of that, restoring and confirming and strengthening and establishing by His grace, for his, his glory. So here's the first application. It is at the end of a difficult experience that God reveals the benefits. It is at the end of, diff of the difficult experience that God reveals his, his benefits. I say that to strengthen you, encourage you, to establish you, to restore you because some of you are in the difficult experience and you don't see how this makes sense. You don't want it. You don't feel established. You don't feel encouraged. You don't feel restored. You don't feel confirmed. You are living in the through many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom of, of God. And what you need reminded of when you're in those days is that even though you don't feel it and you don't see it, that everything that happens to God's people is a part of His plan. He doesn't never, He is never judging or punishing His people. He has done that in Christ. He is only shaping and molding and conforming us. And most of the time, it won't be till the end of the difficult experience that you will, able to, you will be able to see the benefits. This is because of the second application. It is going to sound very similar. It is through faith in Christ's difficult experiences that we receive all of His benefits. It is through Christ's difficult experiences that we get the benefits. He's forsaken, we're accepted. Okay? He dies so that we can live. He received God, receives God's judgment on the cross so that we can receive only God's mercy. We were aliens and rebels apart from the family of God. Through Christ's life, death, and resurrection, we're adopted into the family of God and are now His sons and His daughters. Paul and Barnabas may be able to preach the gospel better than me, but they can't preach a better gospel. The same gospel that they preached all of those years ago in all of those places is being preached right now to you. And this message will be one that I am praying will cause some of you to believe, some of you to get angry and offended, so that you will perhaps be aware of your need to believe. Okay? It is this. You are a born sinner. You are a sinner by nature. You are a sinner by choice. It gets worse. You can do nothing to change it. Nothing. Completely unable to change it. Completely unable to balance the scales in your favor or pay for it. Completely deserving of every difficult experience you go through. And after you die, eternal judgment. That's true of me too. Good news.
God is merciful and kind. And 2,000 years ago, in a point in history, He sent the Son of God to live a life as your representative. That everything He does, when you believe in Him, that good, perfect life gets counted to you as if you did it. Every bad thing you and I have ever done was placed on Christ at the cross so when God wants to judge and punish your sin and mine, He punishes Jesus instead. How do you know that's true? Not only because God said it's true, but after He did it, He raised Jesus back to life and says, He's Lord, He's God, worship Him, trust Him, follow Him. What do I have to do? Nothing. Just receive it. Just receive the gift. That's faith. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, do that now. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's why they make that trip. Why would they do that? Because they believe that that's really true. Real sin is involved. Real eternal souls are at stake. Real mission matters. You really matter. Jesus really is God. If you've never trusted Christ, call on Him now. And then as you do, as the hymn goes, through many toils, dangers, snares, I have already come. Twas grace that brought me safe thus far. Grace will lead me home. And we're not that far, guys. Not that much longer. We're almost home. Let's pray. Jesus, you once told your followers, and they wrote it down so that we could know it. Truly I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me, has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Like we sang earlier, Jesus, thank you. So we were once your enemy, and now we're seated at your table. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your hand in our life. Thank you for your deliverance from judgment, and your rescue from sin. I pray that you give faith to everyone here in the room, that you give us a love for Christ. May your grace save, strengthen, and encourage every one of us today. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. At the end of every sermon, we, we respond by obeying Jesus' command to his people to take crackers and wine as symbolic, tangible representations of his body and blood, which was broken and shed on our behalf. And if you have trusted Christ, whether you're a member of our church or not, you've trusted Christ, we invite you to participate in the experience of what is sometimes called communion or the Lord's table or lo the Lord's supper because it was at that final meal of Jesus with his followers that he gave the command. He, lifting bread, said, This is my body broken for you. Take this in remembrance of me. Eat this in remembrance of me. Likewise, also he took the cup and passed it and said, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is for you. As often as you eat this bread and you drink that cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. So this is just a little taste of the family meal, looking forward to the day in which we're with Jesus once again, eating it together. It's a time of confession, a time of remembrance, a time of proclamation. So we'll pass it, and as you take those elements and pass it to the person next to you, Say, this is body, uh, Christ's body broken for you. This is Christ's blood shed for you. Feel free to pray. We're going to sing. Feel to, uh, free to be silent in reflection. Feel free to tell a story of God's grace in your life to the person next to you.
but it's a family meal to be enjoyed around Christ. So let's do that. start from the top of that verse again. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to Treasure, how great. 
thank you for worshiping with us this morning. My name is Rory. I'm one of the pastors here. If by any chance you are new, looking to connect, you can feel free to take one of those connect cards off the seat backs in front of you, fill it out, take it to the connect desk out front, or you can drop it in the give boxes on the opposite ends of the wall there. It's still just the wall. Not, it's got to have a name of some sort, but we'll get there. Someone will follow up with you that way and uh, get you connected to what we're doing here at Redemption Church. I want to encourage you men in the room to attend this coming Saturday our October Men's Breakfast. Normally we have it on the second Saturday of every month, but you'll see why we're not doing that for this month in just a bit. Um, we're kind of gearing this towards all youth group and up age. So fathers, bring your sons, bring your grandfathers, your uncles, your nephews, whoever. Just come on out for food and fellowship and, and short devotional from 9 a.m. to 10 o'clock, October 1st. That's this Saturday morning. And then the reason why we're not doing it on the second Saturday is because on the second Saturday, October 8th, the women of Redemption Church are taking our day to go and up to Hocking Hills do a retreat uh, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So it's going to be a day-long event. Lunch will be provided. Event is free. So contact Anna Elkins. There's a number on the back of the bulletin there where you can get signed up, ideally by October 1st. And then lastly, if you uh, desire to be a member of Redemption Church, and this is for everyone. I don't care if you're here for another three months or another three years or 30 years or whatever. Uh, one thing I do know for, for certain is not what God has in store for your life, but I know for certain that God wants you to be a member of a local church, wherever you are. So if you're looking to take that step and become a member of Redemption, uh, you can take that Connect card, you can take it to the Connect desk, fill it out, get signed up, which and that's going to start October 9th. October 9th at 9 a.m. for six consecutive Sundays. Child care is provided, and that's all I got. All right, before I read the benediction, I'd like to point our eyes and our attention to verse 28 of Acts 14, reason being it's going to sort of fuel the benediction itself. Verse 28 says of Acts 14, this is after all that has gone on in the events of Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey, they remained no little time with the disciples. Now he could have said they remained a long time, but he didn't. He said they remained no little time. And I pray the same would be said of Redemption Church and the people that make it up. So stretch out your hands and receive this benediction. Now may the Lord who brought you into the family and fold of God be the one who keeps and leads you into the house and home of God. May the encouragement you find to remain in the faith not come not only from within, but also from without, from the fellow saints and sinners who we call brothers and sisters in Christ. Go now from this place, being renewed by the household of God, and may we all remain no little time with one another. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all Redemption Church together said, Amen. You're dismissed. Trust in one that died.